we're all dealing with uh, nowadays caused by COVID-19. Uh, my name is Saba al uh, I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Um, I'm a Humentum board member and very proud of that and the CEO of a British-based donor foundation called the Asfari Foundation. I have with me um, uh, four uh, brilliant colleagues uh, who are dealing with the challenges as we speak. They are experimenting with solutions and trying to adjust to uh, the world um, in its new shape. So without any further ado, uh, I'll pass it to each one of them to introduce themselves, their name, the company or the organization they work for and where they're based. Uh, maybe we start with Haley. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you today. Uh, my name is Haley Bryant. I work with FHI 360 in Mozambique, and I manage a national level USAID and PEPFAR funded project that supports orphans and vulnerable children. And our consortium includes CARE as an international organization and about 50 local community based organizations. Uh, thank you, Haley. Charles? Hi everyone, my name is Charles Soussier. Um, I serve as uh, the country director of Christian Aid UK here in Nigeria. Um, I'm based in Abuja, uh, but uh, coordinating about 10 offices spread across Nigeria um, and different sub regional levels, uh, operating with a staff base of almost 400 people um, and responding to the humanitarian crisis in Nigeria, amongst other development projects. It's a big pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you. Ronald? Thank you. Um, my name is Ronald Kirabira. I work with um, the World Oil Fund for Nature, also known as WWF, in the role of uh, Director of Finance. And um, I'm responsible for offices in Africa, Asia Pacific, and um, Europe. Pleasure joining this call. Last but not least, Juan, I can't see you. Okay, can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Juan Sheenan. Uh, I'm the country representative for uh, Catholic Relief Services in Zambia. Uh, I've been with the agency for around 20 years or so. And in Zambia, our, our primary focus is HIV and AIDS, and we are actually on the front lines for the COVID response. Glad to be here today. Great to have you with us. So um, just to maybe jump into the deep waters of this discussion that's consuming most of our lives, we're trying today with these four, you know, hands-on uh, uh, decision makers, really, and, uh, uh, you know, people who are dealing with the situation on the ground firsthand to understand and to shed a light on real-time lessons learned. We can't, any of us cannot complain, complain without necessarily understanding the intensity of what these people are dealing with on a daily basis, but maybe just to shed a light on the pandemic and what it caused. Uh, the pandemic has introduced uh, radical changes on both the professional and personal levels. Um, it had forced us um, um, and tens of millions of people around the world to adopt to remote working um, um, almost overnight. It took us all by surprise, although we saw it coming, so we can't necessarily say that we were totally surprised. Um, from education to administration to banking to yoga classes and everything in between, we have suddenly found ourselves having to adjust to uh, uh, engaging uh, while retaining social distancing and engaging uh, through technology. So the level of comfort to how we use technology to facilitate every single detail of our lives became absolutely critical. Although the pandemic introduced a new kind of disruption, in many ways it is simply accelerating changes that should have been introduced to our sector and so many other sectors uh, uh, way before. Um, I was reading a very interesting article and they, in that article they, they say the shift to remote working has been going on for 50 years. Um, and that is really um, um, since the first oil crisis in early 1970s. And even though the digital transformation of work in the last 10 years has been faster than ever before, it has just become even faster. What's really interesting is that for most of us, those who worked in the field, and I come from over 20 years of leading response teams, you know, in active um, situations like, for instance, the Syria response, the Yemen response, Iraq, Libya, 
we always knew that we can react to a situation that will come to an end. So we applied emergency measures with the hope that one day the emergency will go away and will go back to normal. With COVID-19, we are acting with a very emergency humanitarian mindset, but we all do know in the heart of hearts that this emergency is not going away. It's going to reshape how we interact and how we deliver our services, how we engage with our teams, how we engage with our beneficiaries once and for good. So it requires from us a critical paradigm shift on how we replan our, you know, our existence and how we really rethink our operations. But again, being you know, a country director or team leader, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I'm certain that it was not that easy for you to be pushed completely out of your comfort zone overnight and adapt and adopt to new realities from team management to delivery of services to capabilities within your organization that allows you to deliver. So it would be absolutely critical for us to understand how did COVID-19 push you out of your comfort zone and how have you had to adjust in order to remain responsive to the so many needs that you are dealing with. Haley, what are you doing? How are you first? <laughs> are you surviving the, the tensions? <laughs> Um, we're, you know, we're like everybody, we're adapting. Mozambique, uh, uh, not closed down, went to a state of emergency about two months ago and they just extended it another month. We have about 250 cases and that is increasing at an increasing rate right now. So we're really not sure how long this is going to last. Um, but for us, you know, we're a case management program where we visit households twice a month. We have field teams that actually visit the households twice a month. Um, and it's very much an oral culture. It's very much face to face. We haven't been able to do that. So we've shifted to telephone case management as much as we can. But about 40% of our households don't have um, phones. So we're trying to deal with that. And about half of our households are held in, headed by elderly people and about 30% of our field outreach workers are, um, are high risk. So we have really had to look at how do we protect these people that are vulnerable who are also helping other people who are even more vulnerable than them. Um, so we've shifted to remote work and we're in the process of providing cell phones for people that don't have them. And um, we have really emphasized communication uh, as we've gone through this process. Uh, fortunately, our team has been through a lot of changes already, mostly externally driven, and we've already adopted the model that our agility makes us stronger. Um, so our team fully buys into that. Um, so when a new change comes along, we we roll with it. But communication for us has been really key. Um, and as a leader, having to be really on top uh, of everything that's happening. And at the beginning, it was managing every detail and really knowing what's happening in the communities, how do we respond, looking at the interplay between our ops folks as well as our technical and programmatic folks, and really pushing them to work together to solve problems. Um, I could go on, but that's probably enough for now. Yeah, no, thank you, Haley. I think you raised very important points. And, you know, we always ask about the comfort zone of the organization, but then we broaden our perspective to look at the so many spheres of influence around our operating model, our delivery mechanisms. And then we start realizing that, you know, the social and the physical infrastructure of the communities we serve uh, need, you know, an equal upgrade to, uh, uh, you know, to what we need to do as, as organizations. Charles, what's happening with you? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Um So for Christian, um, I think I wouldn't say we are entirely in the comfort zone. Uh, the reason is because, um, as you all know, Nigeria has one of the biggest humanitarian crises globally right now in the northeast of Nigeria. Um, and being one of the frontliners in that response, I wouldn't say we were operating from a comfort zone because we're already on the edge if you work in that kind of um, setting. 
So to, to a large extent, um, uh, that defined our humanitarian work and put us on the edge. So we were already a little bit activated, you know, to operate in, uh, in a situation that takes us out of our comfort zone. Uh, we were working in different locations, for instance, where uh, there is no power, there is no road network, we have to go by choppers. Uh, that's not an everyday lifestyle kind of work. I mean, uh, we have to use satellite phones to communicate. Uh, but you can imagine operating from that kind of highly charged environment with COVID-19 on top of it. To be honest, it threw us off balance because we had to, again, reimagine what it would look like to program from a COVID-19 implication on top of a humanitarian you know, experience. Um, and I'd like to just focus on that because uh, for our development work in other parts of Nigeria, yeah, it was easy to say, you know what, guys, everybody sit at home, um, you know, get internet and all of that. In the Northeast, in the humanitarian crisis, it wasn't the case. Um, so people needed to be fed. We feed people on a monthly basis, giving them food rations. We give them, you know, health, uh, you know, medical supplies and all of that. We can't tell people to sit at home. That life has to continue because this is already an emergency situation. Um, so I think that was the experience we had. And I think what it did was to think a little bit more smartly and ask ourselves, um, what would be the worst case scenario that would really make us not do anything? And we didn't think COVID-19 was that situation. And so we modified systems, we improved our delivery models, we improved security for staff and welfare for staff, duty of care was heightened. Um, and I think that's the reality that we dealt with within the period. Yes, thank you. Very, very valuable points. And I, I genuinely agree with you. And I, you know, we've been advising our colleagues here to deploy some of the standards and the systems that are used in a typical humanitarian setting and apply those and streamline them into how we approach development. Because as we said, this may start as a reactive emergency, but it's not the kind of emergency that will go away anytime soon. And that ability to take a step back, absorb the shock and activate systems that do exist that were successful in humanitarian responses may be uh, another thing that we have to delve deeper into and maybe you know have a session just strictly talking about what can we learn from him, our humanitarian responses uh, as we respond to COVID-19. Uh, it would be great to hear from you, Ronald. What are you doing? Thank you. Well, in terms of um, our, um, the, what we're doing at, the, at this point in time, uh, when we had um, uh, this crisis evolve, uh, we had to rapidly respond to multiple stakeholder demands for information, the key issues that people are raising uh, from a stakeholder point of view. What are the disruptions uh, going to do to our offices? And what do we have to do to respond to the, uh, the lockdowns that we are uh, escalating every uh, side of the world where we operate? And um, um, there was a surge in terms of um, information re required from management, both at the country field office level, but also at um, head office. And uh, so our um, uh, immediate um, action was to develop um, a response plan to COVID. And that basically uh, brought on board the key stakeholders with a clear uh, plan of um, what our response was on short term actions, what the uh, action plan would be in terms of business continuity, and um, how we'll engage with um, our key donors and what the medium plans would be. So that uh, is what we did, to formulate a plan of action that would keep uh, the stakeholders engaged, and then uh, put together a communication plan, as Haley did indicate. So this has formulated our basis for engagement and the updates that we provide, but also looking out for new emerging developments that could disrupt our problems even further. So that's what is keeping us um, uh, busy from a um, finance operation point. Yeah, you make it sound so easy. Uh, <laughs> it's not. Um, and no. 
again, I mean, um, an approach that really is worth considering, you know, reacting maybe in the short term, but then once you're over that reaction, you understand that this is going to need a medium to long term replanning and uh, um, critical um, um, acceptance of a paradigm shift in every aspect of how we do our business. Um, um, mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Juan. Sure. So, so I think one of the interesting things about this pandemic or emergency is that we saw it coming. It didn't hit Southern Africa as heavy and fast as it hit Europe, the US, and, and obviously China and the rest of Asia. So that, that little bit of time gave us a chance to kind of come up with some contingency plans in the office. Uh, I was meeting with the government, talking about trying to listen to what they were planning on doing. So it provided us a, a little bit of valuable time in terms of what are we going to do in the case of a lockdown? What are we going to do in the case of a, of a, a semi lockdown and so on? Um, and then all of a sudden it hit and it hit quick when it did. Um, Zambia never locked down completely. Um, as I was saying before, the majority of our programming is HIV related. We're working with, with the most vulnerable people in the country. And so our programs never stopped functioning. Uh, the Ministry of Health asked us to help with them with a COVID response. And so we really did not stop working, but we did close the office in terms of having uh, people work from home. So that was a bit of a challenge because we had the, to communicate uh, unlike we never, like we never did before. We had all staff meetings online with 190 people. Uh, I had to buy wireless devices for a number of people so they can work from their homes. Um, and I was just, you know, as we were in the middle of this, I was really concerned with our staff. I was really concerned with the well-being of our staff. How are they handling it? So I would normally have all staff meetings every other month. I actually had them for every two weeks just to hear concerns. And I think, you know, I think you were saying this, Saba, communication has been key, uh, especially during a, a time like this. And I think this has really helped us out. I've talked to people. Uh, a number of people have voiced their concerns. They're, they're fearing because they're, they're on the front lines or working in the clinics. Um, and I've talked to them and we don't, we don't force people to work in these situations. And I think that was the key. Um, it's become the norm now. Uh, we're all working through it. We're masking up everywhere, hand sanitizer all over the place. When we drive out to the field, we're getting checked uh, from all over the places, from our temperatures and, and everything. So it's really been a different way of working, but we didn't really stop the quality of work, which was, which was impressive. And, and I really didn't know what to expect when this came in. Um, so I, I, I just emphasize that communication with all staff, ensuring that everyone is, is, is okay and, and uh, making sure that their well-being is the most important, and then, and then we're able to do our job. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, mean I, can, I can go on, but yeah, that's, that's basically where we are right now. And imagine, and, I, I, and everything you said, I, I fully agree with, but I think you raised a point that is very close to my heart. And I think as, as you know, leaders in our foundations, we need to always be reminded or remind ourselves of, and that is that, you know, our staff are not their jobs. You know, these people have their own personal lives. And I think the disruption, or I believe the disruption did not only hit the professional aspects of anyone's life, but you know, it, it, it did hit every aspect of, you know, uh, be, be you a father, a mother, a sister, or what have you, as individuals coping with the challenges and changes and making sure that we have the headspace to take care of our families and come and interact differently with our colleagues and uh, our job, um, the sense of, you know, security around livelihoods, all these things are matters that really can have a huge implication on that positive well-being of our staff. And unless we do that kind of I don't know, maybe even personalize the communication so that we are, you know, clear in terms of how much our staff mean to us as assets and how critical it is that they, their well-being being taken care of. I think if we don't do that, then we don't have a team to retain. And I absolutely agree with you, Juan. You all are, again, decision makers, your leaders. You do the, you know, annual and every three year and five year strategic planning and budgeting. And we always have contingency line items in our budgets. And we do our very best to prepare for, you know, the unexpected. But that was literally just so different. It's, it's different in its nature and its scale. If you are to go back a year from where you're standing right now, and was to given, you'd be given that magic wand to have one thing 
one thing in your planning or thinking or in how you invest in the infrastructure of your foundation so that you are better prepared to respond to this pandemic? What would that one thing be? What would that one thing that would change your agility, maybe increase your resilience be? Haley. You're muted, Haley. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, I think setting up ways to do remote training and remote communication earlier. Um, it also would have been something that helped us cut costs, but we've sort of very much drawn into the fact that it's very much a face-to-face -face oral culture. Um, but now we've had to make the shift. So we've had to, to shift to, you know, as I said, remote phone calls. And I think investing in getting even just inexpensive smartphones for all of our field cadres, I think would have been a worthy investment. And something we looked at, but we kept putting it off. Um, I think that would have helped us with data collection as well, and also gotten people already into the habit of that kind of communication. And now we're trying to think about, well, how do we do remote training um, if we can't do these face-to-face -face ones? And that's our next struggle. But I think what I would have done early on is just gotten more remote communication devices for everybody and trained them up to use them. Haley, maybe a follow-up question. I mean, you can do that, you know, for your own team and potentially you can have, you know, centers and communities that can facilitate the interaction with the you know, end users or the beneficiaries as we refer to them in our sector. But do you think that not equipping the entire community with the necessary communication mediums or technology and not bringing them with us on, you know, a, a, a fair level of uh, digital fluency or literacy, would that exclude by default some of our end users from receiving and benefiting from our services? That is exactly one of the reasons we wanted to do it before, but we never had the budget. 70% of our case community case managers are women. And in a mobile use study that was done in Mozambique a few years ago, it found out if households have a phone, it's usually the man that manages the phone. So for us, getting these self smartphones into the hands of these women as a work tool meant they controlled it, they had access to information. And because of our structure, um, cell phone literacy was an issue as well, but because of our management, supervision, and support structure, they would have had the support to learn how to use those devices um, to the maximum as well. So that is one of the reasons we want to do it. Yep. I can't unmute. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute myself. We have to learn how to interact with this technology. Charles, what about you? What would that one magical thing be? Well, um, I don't know how much it's going to be, <laughs> but I think uh, what if, if I have uh, to go back one year and replan my budget, my staff, and the way we work, I would change the whole concept of how we work from a physical office. Uh, because sitting here right now, I understand that uh, we've, we've continued to be operational. Uh, there are critical stuff that remains even more useful working from home. So what that tells me is that not everybody, not every group needs to be based in the office. So I would change the way I give contracts to staff for particular roles. So there are some roles where we would hire, you don't need to come to the office every day. It's, it's, it's a given. And whether COVID-19 ends today, I am going to enforce that because that's one of the biggest takeaways. There are some key people whose roles are tied to support um, and their support does not necessarily mean they should be in the office physically every day now what that does ultimately is that if i'm able to do that for a staff strength of about 150 full-time staff it may shrink my staff strength to as low as 50. what that means is i don't need big offices i don't need huge costs on infrastructure i don't need huge costs of running the office I will reinvest that money on giving people the ability to be able to work effectively from homes. So better laptops, better internet infrastructure, um, better communication gadgets. I would make that investment in people 
rather than in the office, getting a huge infrastructure in the office where we all have to converge in the office. Yeah. That is my biggest takeaway. We can be as effective as we can be or we want to be if we deploy solutions where people can operate from wherever they are. And I bet you, I would imagine that so far I've gotten even more productivity from some people working from home rather than being in the office, being on probably Twitter or Facebook all day. Yep. I, again, I fully agree with you. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from Humentum as an organization since they, you know, that's their, that's their culture. The Humentum team is spread all around the world and they work from home. That's their, like, that's how they do. That's how they do their daily work. So I'm, I'm asking Humentum from, you know, uh, this platform to help us, you know, with maybe a one-on-one basic principles of how to make work from home most efficient and effective. One thing, maybe a, a follow-up question to you, Charles. I live in London and our houses are this big, like literally, like little boxes. So can every single person rearrange their lives and their households to work from home? Uh, would an employer like yourself or a boss or a leader be more understanding to the and be more flexible around the challenges that comes with working from home you know you're not alone in the house now we are schooling our kids from home so would there be some flexibilities that need to be introduced with the concept of working from home well yes good question uh, in one of my management meetings, uh, I, I created a typical scenario for you. We're having a senior management meeting with my team, and in the course of the meeting, one of my staff who was talking at that point, mm. uh, his little daughter, who is about three years old, came to him, and, and we heard him struggling, like, you know, no, go on the meeting. And, no, and I said, no, it's okay. She should sit there. Um, she should sit. She should be part of the meeting. I mean, it comes with a new wave of understanding. It comes with trust. Um, just on the chat box, I see somebody asking me uh, if, that, Charles, this new way of working comes with a lot of trust. I agree. It, it takes a lot of trust. That is why life cannot be normal. We have to trust each other. So I understand a mother who has four kids. I understand that the kids may be running around. Um, I understand that they may be needs at home. I will work according to that schedule. Now, you may argue that, yeah, some schedule will not wait for us. So if we we'll have a report to deliver, or if I have um, X, Y, Z to deliver and it's time bound, how do I negotiate that? But that's the word. How do we negotiate that? And it comes back to the whole communication. So recently, I've heard myself saying more around to my team. So what will work for you? And I hear them saying, um, Charles, I have to do X, Y, Z that I know I can do this by this time. And I'm like, okay, let's work by that time. So I think this brings, a, this brings more around the uh, humanity than the reality of what work actually means. Finally, the last word I'll say is I've had to renegotiate role profiles. I've had to renegotiate uh, expectations from roles. Well, so sir. in the past, I assume that, well, you know your job description. I want to see in the office these days. We negotiate what are the must do, what do you need to do, and then we focus on that, and, and, and that's it. Yeah, and I think that's part of the you know, agility. Uh, um, and yes, the, absolutely. The to demonstrate, and uh, you know, while we are maybe socially isolating or socially isolated, uh, we are more connected now than ever before. Uh, so um, absolutely very valid points. Ronald, what's your you know, wish? <laughs> Thanks. I think um, you'll agree with me that the work that we do is quite uh, interlinked, be they project staff or fundraising or finance and operations teams. The one thing that um, would make difference is having um, enabling systems, an ERP system that actually enables uh, information flows uh, to be um, shared across the different stakeholders seamlessly. That was the biggest challenge that we faced um, with this crisis. How do we keep the different teams and management uh, informed of what is going on in the project in one country or field office without having to ask for a lot of information through Excel sheets and things like that. Mm -hmm. If we 
we had one thing uh, like an ERP system to also have given us a lot more agility to respond to the crisis instead of spending a lot more time on data gathering. So we spent quite significant amounts of time on information gathering on the project implementation, on the challenges that we're facing out in the field than we actually would have loved to. So if there's one thing that would make a difference is to have a robust and fit for purpose ERP system. Because even with remote working, that is really a key enabler. And it helps quite a lot because most of the questions people were asking of us as, um, at AQ uh, were really about information of what is happening in the field and not historical data. They wanted information, real time, and information that we could use to make decisions. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. I was talking to one of my colleagues here in the office and he said that he he is trying to figure out how to have that coffee space, virtual coffee space, where people can just tell each other a quick update, you know, on their way uh, out or in, uh, and not having to email um, every single staff member every time he wants to, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, conduct a, a session or a meeting. So that flow of information, having the information accessible by all staff at the right level of you know, authority is going to be another challenge that we'll all have to deal with. Those who had the system in place are definitely in a much better place. Juan, what about you? Sure. So just to chime in on the working from home, it's been an interesting challenge and advantage, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people work better at home than others, obviously. And I think, you know, it's not just something that you can just fall into. I think people have to be trained to concentrate. Um, but it's it's been... Myself, I prefer to be in the office. There's too many distractions at home. Um, but, it, but to go back to your question, if I were to do something different a year ago, I would have invested more of my time in the relationships with the private sectors and the private companies in Zambia, uh, the mining companies. There's a lot of mining companies here, copper, gold. Um, you know, they, they become very advantageous, advantageous during these crises. They have disposable income that can support a lot of the responses that we do. And, and I would have gone back and, and you know, not even work with them, but just know who's who, do maybe a stakeholder analysis, finding out who's doing what and map them out because they are, they are becoming more and more important uh, in Southern Africa, especially in these regions where you have a lot of mining, a lot of private sector, a lot of oil industries, um, they would become very valuable to NGOs like us. And they, and they really want to help. They want to help, but if they don't know you, they don't know where to go. So they go immediately to the government and then the government comes to you. But I think that's the one thing I would have changed is to really uh, kind of find out who's doing what in the country and get to know them. So I can just put them on my speed dial, call them up immediately when something like this comes up. Yeah. You're, absolutely, you're absolutely spot on. And you're, you're, this is an excellent segue to you know the next question, Juan. I mean, we're all expected now to you know, bounce forward as if, you know, magically we'll find all the resources we need to do all the magical things that you have just mentioned, because all those are necessities if we are to ensure business continuity, effectiveness, you know, change in, in the mechanism and the, the approach through which we engage with our constituencies or beneficiaries. But this comes with a cost. And we're expected now to adapt, uh, uh, restructure ourselves, learn, potentially, you know, uh, 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 procure so many new systems, uh, upskill and upgrade, um, you know, communication tools in the hands of the beneficiaries that we work with. And that's absolutely doable, but it comes with a cost. Number of things. How are we going to bounce forward? And second, who's going to help us do that? Are donors understanding to the need to rethink the you know, the plans and the way we budget. I'm sure that to Haley's point, you know, she must have approached a thousand donors asking for cell phones to be made available, you know, to all these women, but there were always constraints on what we are allowed to budget for. Um, do we have to think outside the box to Juan's point and think of, you know, the, the partners closest to home, you know, the mining companies, the all those that we did not engage with in the past, 
are there technologies in Silicon Valley that can be deployed and make our lives easier? How do we bounce forward and ensure that as we react to the situation today, we're not just doing that for a short period of time, but we are adapting and adopting to a new reality that is here to stay. How can we ensure that we remain relevant and responsive to people's needs? Juan, I think I, I, I'd start this yeah. with you. Okay, great. I mean, that's exactly the way to go forward. I would say learning how to communicate with the private sector because NGOs like, like CRS are not used to working with mining companies or cellular companies or, or oil companies. So I think finding out how you get in on the table with these guys, talking to them and, and, and talking uh, their language because it's really not the same as talking to our traditional donors like USAID or uh, the European Union or so on. So I think we really have to change our skill set. Uh, mm -hmm. I think going forward and learn how to talk to all actors and not just focus on one donor. Um, you know, a lot of the private sectors, I've met with them. I, I lived in Angola for a while and, and I was always working, trying to talk to the oil companies. They speak a different language and their language is, well, what can I get out of this? I give you X amount of dollars to do whatever you want to do. What is in it for me? They, they understand what the NGOs do. They understand there is an important Point, uh, an important sector that they can't reach, that only the NGOs can reach. And I think that's where we have to go in there and talk to them and say, listen, you guys are making X amount of dollars in countries. Let us do some of the corporate social responsibility that we've been doing for years. We just haven't called it that. And I think this is something that's going to have to change, not looking at our traditional donors and traditional partners that we have done in the past. And I can tell you that this going forward, when COVID ends, this is the way we're going to be operating, I'm sure, is talking to the private sector, the private companies, and finding out how to get in uh, uh, in, their, in their doors and on the table to, to negotiate. Yeah, I'm um, learning new ways is going to be absolutely, you know, absolutely critical. We've been begging, you know, um, organizations to stop thinking charity and start thinking business models. and. Uh, you know, factor in that money will not continue to flow from, you know, institutional donors our way. We have to think in a smarter way, but you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of learning that we have to do as we go. Uh, Charles, what about you? Well, I think significantly what will change um, uh, will be um, reconstituting how we set up offices. Um, so in the last two months, I've just closed one of our sub offices. Um, in some region in Nigeria. And when I say shut the office, I didn't shut the operation. I shut down the physical office space. And what I did was I spoke to a local partner, a, a local NGO in that region. I said, uh, we're working with you. We're doing about the same thing. Can my staff share offices with you? And then we share the cost, we share the bill. And they agreed. So that's what's happening. I found out it's cheaper, it's better, integration, learning, and all of that. Um, and that's what I'm going to do more of. Uh, I think the word there is leverage, um, and there's smarter ways of working. Uh, leverage with resources. Um, it could be with anybody. It could be with uh, a private sector, just like John said. It could be with a local actor. It could be with, you know, an organization, anybody who is willing to share costs. Because what it does is that it reduces the amount of investment one single agency or organization would make in setting up a physical office in a remote area where there are other players. Like, what's the point? Like, can we get to a point where we have pubs in local villages, in communities, where a couple of one, two, three, four partners could come in and they all operate from there? In fact, networking is better, leverage is better, learning is better, and you know, there are so many other benefits that could come with that. It's cheaper, it's effective, and then we're bringing people together. And that, for me, is what I'm going to do differently. And then finally, Again, like I said, I'm going to rejig the way we do contracts. Uh, I'll be very more, I'll be more specific to what people will do and when they will do it, how they will do it. And to be honest, they don't need to come to the physical office. As long as I can negotiate that from wherever you are, just the way Humentum does its work, which is amazing. I think Humentum has thought many years ahead. I think I will adopt that kind of strategy going forward. 
the operational efficiencies and effectiveness will be measured differently. And I think we'll have, we'll be under a lot of pressure from donors to rethink the cost of our operations because now this period proved that we can do more for less. So how can we factor that to become the new normal? Ronald and Haley, briefly, I would love to hear from you because I want to make sure that we find time to answer the brilliant questions that I'm trying to keep track of on the, uh, on the chat box. Ronald. Well, thank you. Uh, in terms of um, um, what we did actually to do to bounce forward, in my contention, there's one really critical issue to be considered. At the moment, the major risk that we face as a sector is the risk of um, organizational failure. It's what you're seeing actually in the business private sector is also a reality for our sector. So the one thing that I think would be important to look into bouncing forward is to look in the short term on how do we ensure that our organizations survive. And what is central to that is to ensure that we have robust as aspects around reviewing our financial sustainability. Ask ourselves, what if a major donor falls through the cracks? What if the lockdown prevents us from doing the type of work we're doing? How will we cope and survive? Thank you. Haley? Unmute yourself, Haley. I'll be very brief because a lot of the points I wanted to make have been made by others. Um, I think for us bouncing forward, uh, technology, as you mentioned, is key, but finding creative ways to balance the use of technology and still maintain that human connection, which is so important for our work. Yeah. Don't quite see how to do that yet, but I know it's important yeah. and I'd like to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot for us to learn, I think, you know, in terms of the usability of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, virtual reality, the human centric usability of technology is going to be the challenge that we'll all have to um, experiment with. Absolutely valid points, uh, a lot to learn, and I know that we are still going through the learning. So many questions are uh, extremely, you know, relevant to the discussion, but there seem to be at least one uh, uh, cross-cutting theme, and that is more around people, you know, their sense of comfort working from home, their sense of belonging to a group, not fearing that, uh, you know, by me being uh, asked to work from home, I'm, I'm being made redundant or my chances of being the first to let go of is going to increase. A lot of questions around trust, you know, how do I trust that the staff are delivering? How does my employer or my manager trust that I'm putting in the hours or, you know, doing the work that I'm expected to do? Um, for some odd reason, Kim, I can't move the, the chat up and down, so I'm not able to see but what's on my screen. Is there anything that I'm missing from the questions that you'd like to highlight for us? Sure, there are a number of questions. There's a lot in going on in the chat, and thank you everybody for those who are asking questions and answering um, with each other. Um, there were a, a number of questions around kind of the practical, tangible pieces of what are you doing now around how are you managing Zoom fatigue? Are you providing internet data? How are you allowing your teams to travel to the field? I'm happy to save those to the end if we have time as well and just note that Humentum is, um, has been, has been uh, convening regularly scheduled COVID-19 related roundtables where a lot of these questions are being asked and answered and shared and, and honestly just commiserated with. Um, and and we're, we're built, we are building resources at, and in real time right now, Humentum staff are saying, okay, how do we start doing this? in a time zone that works for the audience on, in, on this call. And so we'll get more information out for you on that front. Um, there are also a few questions. Um, Gordon just wrote in the chat, COVID-19 has affected donors too. Do you have any post COVID-19 strategies for work to continue? And then a few questions around the, that same balance of, should we be looking at um, the, the private sector? Should we be looking at building the institutions and working with them? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> I think, we, you know, uh, I, I would be very happy to stay after the session, maybe to just have a chat in the, uh, you know, after the meeting. But yeah, it would be great to hear some of your thoughts. I mean, as, as, as a CEO of a foundation, a donor foundation, one of the first things that we have done was reach out to all our recipients. And we are a family foundation. So re reaching out to our recipients and making, assuring them that they have, um, you know, 
much more flexibility to rethink their operational settings and to dedicate some of their funds towards digitizing their services where it's possible, upskilling their staff and providing budget for professional development and digital development and upskilling their digital infrastructure. So I, I wonder what kind of communications are you having with your donors? What kind of responses are you getting? And then uh, looking outside the typical, you know, usual suspects of, you know, uh, box of donors to, to, to Juan's point, are you having any conversations with tech providers or communication providers in your context or even globally? It would be good to hear from you. Anyone would like to comment on that? Yes, uh, 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 our most recent experience around this has been renegotiating budget lines. I mean, let's be honest, in the last three months, um, I would have had about maybe 20 to 30 staff who would have flown across the world to attend some one or two days conference somewhere. Um, um, who would have traveled locally. Um, the amount of flights, I have like 50 people flying. Oh, sorry, probably my internet, yeah. Can you hear me clearly now? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so what we've done, what I was saying is we've saved a lot on travel budget lines uh, because uh, we found out that what can see go on, you know, without, you know, huge expenses on travels. And what we've done is renegotiated those travel lines uh, you know, in favor of investing in, in, in capacity to, to be online um, at every point in time. Um, if you know anything about Nigeria, we have one of the worst power supplies anywhere in the world. Very terrible power supplies. You could go days without having power. So even if you have a smartphone, you have internet connection and all of that, and you don't have power, you'll be cut off. So what we've done is to begin to uh, look, work with uh, uh, tech companies to look at how do we invest without paying you huge upfront costs? How yeah. of time? Yeah, so, so that's just what I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, investing in, in, in power or tech over a period of time rather than a one-off huge cost. I think that's one of the biggest uh, 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 experience we've gotten from this experience. Thanks, Charles. Any other like quick solutions that can be provided to people who are asking questions about, you know, facilitating the whole concept of working from home, uh, bringing our staff with us on this, uh, you know, journey of, uh, you know, rapid and, and uh, dramatic change. Ronald, Juan, Haley, any input from your side? Yeah, uh, just quick. Um, I, I would say, Selva, that it does provide a bit of, of flexibility if you have people working from home. Uh, some people, not everyone. Um, working remotely always provides that flexibility of spending more time with your family while you're doing your work, of course. But it does provide that option. And it's not, it's maybe one or two days a week. Um, mm -hmm. I find it that people are more productive right now during this COVID, the last three months. Uh, not that they weren't productive before, but to my surprise, people are very productive. They're using their wire, wireless devices. They're using all these kinds of things. Um, and I think it's because they're in the comfort of their own home and they're able to work at their own speed and we're still getting the good quality that, that we expect. So mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a, it's a balance um, and it does provide a great flexibility to those staff that would like to work at home one or two days a week. Yeah, I also found that uh, overall productivity while people working from home has been quite good. I was a little worried about that, but uh, you know, a lot of our folks and a lot of our team normally goes out to the field to visit the organizations we work with. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't sure how that was going to work, but they've been very good about keeping in touch with them by phone and we've actually had a much faster response time now. Um, I, and I guess that's because people are connected most mm -hmm. of the day. Because uh, mm -hmm. if they were traveling in the field, oftentimes they'd be, you couldn't reach them for a few days at a time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have had to learn the technology. So people who are reluctant before, they've figured it out. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Uh, there are so many questions, and again, I, I think we, we like double the time <laughs> that we had to uh, go through all the questions. But um, maybe just to, uh, because again, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit wary that we're reaching the very end of our time. Maybe we can have a, a quick um, a reflection from, from Ronald before we wrap up, and then maybe we can take this conversation forward uh, um, after the session. Ronald, anything from your side that you'd like to add? Well, it's um, I think one component I want to add, and we've not talked about this before, is that whole aspect around um, risk management. COVID has thrown us a curveball of a risk that we didn't anticipate at all. But from my experience, we have also been focusing very much on financial risks. So this challenges us to look at risks holistically. What are the types of risks that we could encounter in our operations, in our projects, besides financial risks. And um, I looked back actually at the um, assessments of risks uh, that were on the table at the beginning of this calendar year. And um, infectious diseases was one of the top uh, rated risks that the World Economic Forum uh, report pre predicted. I read that report in January and ignored that. Looking back, that's a lesson learned. So I think so, senior management have to put risk at the center of what we do. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas for all of us to you know, reflect on and, and see how we're going to gradually mainstream into our work. I think the pace with which change is, is happening is beyond our ability to sort of you know, uh, manage it. And, uh, um, I'm fortunate to have uh, one of my children uh, does virtual reality and gamification uh, for his university studies. So I have that kind of uh, smart, uh, geeky, um, you know, tech person at home to go to whenever I can't operate one of the so many platforms that I find myself jumping from, you know, uh, between all day. The other day I was asking him, what do I do to bring, you know, my team up to the level of digital knowledge that they should in order for us to continue to operate. And he said, leave them to be, because the biggest obstacle for the revolution in the way organizations operate are going to be the likes of he, when he was referring to me, he said, leaders need to listen to their entry level staff because the younger you are, the more digitally you may be. So let, let them be, learn from them, trust that they know what they do, trust that they are digitally much smarter than you, and let them make decisions jointly with you. I think there's a lot for us to adapt to. There's a lot of change that's coming our way, you know, from donors to how we operate, to how we budget, to how to we, you know, factor risk in every aspect of our business. All of it is going to change, but in the heart of hearts, we have to make sure that we trust our teams, we invest in them so that we can sustain our business. No business can be sustained with only budgets or healthy bank accounts without having a team that cares, a team that can deliver digitally a service that was you know, delivered always face to face with the same passion, same compassion and same love is going to be critical for our success in serving those who need our services unprecedented times, a lot for us to learn. Um, I've learned a lot just listening to, to the panelists in this session, but um, um, I think, you know, we are just about to start a much, much longer journey of continuous learning. I hope that we can bring, um, you know, our, 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 our constitu constituencies with us. And I wish genuinely that our donors would understand that how we used to think is no longer uh, going to be valid for the future. We either learn how to adjust and we either learn and find the delicate balance between the physical and digital or we may become obsolete. I hope that none of us will, uh, but yeah, we have to keep an open mind and learn as we go. Um, thank you to a great uh, uh, panel, uh, um, an absolutely fascinating discussion, lots of questions uh, to be answered, but um, Again, we don't know what we don't know, but we're still learning and we'll continue to. Kim, over to you. Thank you so much, Saba, and thank you to the panelists. Um, it was a, a very uh, fascinating conversation, as you say, um, the, the hour flew by. Um, I am also happy to, I'm happy to say that 
Um, for those of you who need to that who need to jump off and, and take other meetings or, or leave because this was an hour session on your calendar, um, thank you so much for attending. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. For those of you who are able to stay, our panel has graciously agreed to stay on for the next 30 minutes for a post-session chat. And this can be a very informal questions and answers chat um, to, similar to what we've been doing. So please feel free to stay on the line. Um, the recording, it will be um, closed right now and we'll have the post-session chat without the recording. Um, and that will be posted to the conference platform in the next, let's say 12 hours, we'll do our best. Um, all of the recordings from the, the, the previous this week have been added to the conference platform if you haven't been able to see them. There has been so many interesting and good questions and valuable questions in the chat that I'm happy to, um, to give you some information on a few different ways that you can continue to stay involved in these discussions. If you are a member, I highly encourage you to sign up and log into Humentum Connect, our online member platform, where a lot of these conversations have been, um, have been going on for the last few months. We have a COVID-19 channel dedicated to these types of conversations, as well as a COVID-19 resource library, and I'll drop some of those links in the chat. Um, we're also in the process of creating a Facebook group specifically for the OPEX Africa online community. And we'll keep that open for three to four weeks after this conference ends just to continue these conversations. And I've been saving a lot of the questions around what are you doing, you know, around internet and what are you doing around your staff? Um, and I will use that to populate the, the Facebook group so that some of these questions can continue to be answered in real time by all of you. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be announcing how to, how to join that Facebook group tomorrow. Um, so those are a few ways to stay connected in the conversation. So if you have to leave, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you tomorrow. If you're able to stay, um, please do so. And I'm happy just to, to, to put a few questions out there, Saba, if that, if that works for you. Sure. Okay. So um, we, we just touched, Ronald just touched a little bit on this, but there was a question around financial risk analysis and fundraising models. And I know that's been touched a little bit, but I don't know if there were other, other responses to how you are think, approaching your financial risk analysis, fundraising models, possibly scenario planning as well. Um, again, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from, from the panel, but as a donor, it's, um, it might be useful to just maybe give some tips. One of the things that we appreciated the most was the um, the honesty and the transparency with which our recipients, people who are receiving funds from us, approached us saying, look, these are the activities that will not be possible to go ahead with. And these are some of the upfront investments that we need to put in place before we are able to continue delivering the service. For instance, digitizing some of the training materials or upskilling our communication infrastructure. So that early on engagement with your donor on what would what would help them achieve the objectives they originally agreed to? And them understanding that how we think budget and the, the, the requirements for achieving objectives have changed dramatically. So that proactive engagement is absolute essence and very important. But I'm sure you've done some similar interactions and uh, rethought your fundraising. So it would be good to hear from uh, Charles, Ronald, um, Juan or, or Haley. Okay, uh, just to chime in, Saba, I, I mean, your point is well taken. I think when you're looking at different donors, I think the most important thing is finding out about that donor. You can't just go in and with a proposal with your ideas, you find out the do's and don'ts, the sensitivity issues, uh, what their, you know, pet peeves are, what, where do they like focusing their money? And I think that's that takes a bit of time that goes back to some of the mapping that I was discussing. And this includes private sector and private companies as well. Um, I think you really have to find out where, where these guys like funding and where can you match up with what your, what your comparative advantage is in, in different countries, in Nigeria, in Zambia. So um, I think that's, that's a bit, so you have to do a bit of homework, I think, before, you actually start going into donors, find out more about them, have some meetings, initial meetings. Um, but like you're saying, find out, yeah, every donor is very different and, and we just have to find out as much about them as possible. And that could take a little bit of time. It could, some donors take longer than others. And I think just we have to invest uh, in that time spent to find out more about our donors in order to, to diversify our basket funds. 
Absolutely. No, I, I fully agree. The psychology of the of the donor is critical. You know, what's in it for them? What kind of wins, if they are to hear of, would encourage them to engage is absolutely critical. Any other hints or tips or ideas from the panelists? Perhaps the other component I could add to what Yuan said is they need to build relationships with the donors uh, up front so that when it comes to times like this, when it is a crisis, you have a reliable uh, business relationship that you can uh, tap into. I say that um, aware that uh, it takes time to build relationships, but I think a critical success factor. So when Charles was talking about um, budget line changes and getting approvals for those budget line changes, if you have built a relationship over time, you get those approvals much faster. If it was a wobbly relationship with a donor, you're going to have to climb a steep curve. But just to remain realistic, because I think, you know, that's exactly what, you know, participants want from us. Uh, you know, in, in previous situations, for instance, when I was responding to the Syria crisis, I knew that the problem was happening only there. And I had the world to go to ask for help. But with COVID-19, it's happening everywhere. So every government is prioritizing their national best interest. And that's why maybe we should think a little bit, you know, away from the typical institutional donors because governments are struggling just as much as we are with this you know challenging times and think to juan's point more local and i think you know humentum always talked about the importance of localization so building that kind of relationship with local private sector investments and making sure that when talking to them you are highlighting what's in it for for them in terms of protecting the local productivity protecting the national best interest so the engagement with donors or when we talk about donors we no longer have to think usaid you know european union uh, uh, uh giz and what have you we have to think with the vendors and the private sector and the family foundations family businesses within our national context because um, again it is not something that's happening somewhere and the entire world is there to bail us out it is happening everywhere Uh, but switching gears just a little bit, um, there was a comment in the chat earlier around um, recruitment and hiring practice and the fact that um, organizations are more comfortable hiring employees from any location as long as they, they meet that need. Um, and so what does that mean for the future of hiring practices, for the future of talent, um, for the future of uh, recruitment? Yeah, no, it's an extremely important question. I think Kim, no one has much experience with this particular, you know, question than Humentum. You know, I think it, as as an employer now, the global market is my place to look for, you know, capabilities in. I mean, I no longer have to hire someone who's based in London. You know, as long as someone has the skills required, the capabilities I need, and can come and hit the ground running, then they're good to go. So I think we have to rethink you know how we approach that whole kind of you know recruitment employment uh effectiveness and efficiencies are going to play a, a key role but juan ronald i'm sure i mean guys you're considering you know the young unemployed sitting home chilled folks who know digital inside out like your concept of the proper staff member is going to have to change i guess don't you think yeah, just to chime in, I just told Kim I have to take off for another meeting, but just my, my last point. I think you're exactly right. So prior to Zambia, we I worked in Honduras for six years mm -hmm. with CRS and we had we worked with youth groups. And what you're saying is exactly right. The youth know more about technology than any of our experts in any of these NGOs. And I think this is a very attractive point for these youth. I mean, they, they will get bored fast if they're not playing with something. Uh, in their hand. So I think bringing these youth in and utilizing them uh, to, to collecting data, uh, reading data, translating data, I mean, it's great. And, and we've done it, we've done a pretty good job in Central America. And I think this is the way of the future. Uh, my son, who's 13 years old, he knows more about computers and phones and everything than I do. And I often ask him, how do I connect to Zoom or how do I do this? So I think this is the wave of the future, uh, bringing in the youth providing them employment and, and you know, getting them off the streets and, uh, and off of the informal sector. 
I think it's a great way to, to, to tackle that issue. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's, there's plenty of opportunities in every crisis. And I think this is, this is going to be one of the opportunities that we have to really utilize to the best possible. Thank you, Juan. I know you have another meeting, but appreciate your input. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Any other points others would like to maybe? Baba. Yeah. Baba, please. I have an interesting one uh, to raise a situation we're facing right now where we're hiring somebody new. He can't come to Mozambique at this point because there's no flights, um, but we ready to have him start remotely. But then the question comes up about, well, which country's labor law applies? Mm -hmm. And we're not registered in his home country. So can we hire him? So we're grappling with that now, that remote work and Humentum probably has the answer. So I may contact you guys afterwards. But that is, a, you know, it raises different issues yeah. um, that we maybe haven't thought about before. Haley, I'm laughing because I'm putting together a spot poll on that very topic right now. And so in the next 48 hours, look for a spot poll on that question, not just on, you know, staff uh, moving remotely within different countries and within different states in the U.S., but also um, getting a sense of when organizations will be returning to office-based work. And many organizations are starting to think about, you know, how much brick and mortar do we actually need? Um, you know, can we start to shift some of our staff to more full-time remote while keeping some? And so starting to get a gauge what, what folks are thinking about on those topics. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Haley, I, we were in the process of recruiting someone uh, when COVID-19 happened and, uh, you know, they, again, they started remotely and they were like, they don't need to come to the office. You keep working remotely because you know what, we may not need an office after this because it's not taken away from us or our ability to deliver the fact that we are working from home. So why do we pay such, you know, large chunk of money, uh, you know, for a lease? So uh, our thinking will is changing as we speak and uh, Kim a lot of that you've been through guys and I, I think you have a lot to share with us as lessons that you've already learned you know while we're learning I think we can benefit from building on the experience that you have accumulated over the past few years yeah I can't imagine honestly working in an office anymore. I could never go back <laughs> Um, and I will say that I, I mentioned in the chat earlier, but we are for um, a free members webinar on June 16th at 11 o'clock Eastern time in, in the uh, US time, um, it, doing holding a webinar called talent acquisition in the wake of COVID-19. That might be of interest to folks and that um, is being it's being run by one of our members, Joyce Wiru, um, who recently wrote a blog on the topic, I believe. So um, if those are if anyone is interested, please join us for that as well. Um, there is a somewhat relatedly there, uh, Saba, there was a question on mental health. I know that it's a, it's a, it's a big topic for those, but what are, what is everyone doing around mental health for their staff um, in this remote environment? How do we make sure that we are dealing with, with, uh, with self-care? Hmm. Any ideas, any thoughts? Yeah, I could share our experience. Um, so what we've done is uh, uh, we did uh, we set up um, a communication tree um, whereby the senior managers cascade reaching out to their various team members at least weekly. So away from Zoom meetings, away from um, uh, Microsoft Teams and all of that, phone calls like personal touch. How are you today? How's your family? How are you coping? Do you have food at home? Do you have supplies? You know. Uh, like discussions out of work. It's a little bit more to ask, but I think it strengthens relationship and then it gives people an opportunity to just air out, having been locked up at home for, for several days and weeks and all of that. Um, doing it over a couple of weeks, I think it's worked for us. Just checking on people. This is what we we'll typically not do because normally we'll come into the office and everybody puts on the headset and faces their laptops. You don't know if the person spent all night crying because of some family issues. Um, but because we're in an office workspace, people just focus on their laptops. And then when it's time to go home, they grab their stuff and they're out. But now we're not seeing each other that often. But you pick up the phone and you call and you say, how are you doing? Like, how was today? Have you eaten? Uh, how are the kids? Uh, if you're alone, like, how are you coping alone? What else are you doing? You know, 
and then you get to just talk. Uh, it's been, I think it's built a new level of relationship for my team. And then we're doing it at different levels. So not one person having to call everybody. But the team leader calls his immediate um, direct report. The direct reports call their downliners. And then we do this regularly, like weekly. It's improving a lot, you know, of communication. And people are, we are hearing a lot of things we never used to hear when we work at the office. And usually when we do that, then we cascade the issues up and it comes back to me. And then I highlight the key issues and then we think of how to deal with them at that level. But of course, by the side, we strengthen our safeguarding and our protection and inclusion uh, and modalities to ensure that you know, we, we are watching out, that our, our, our radar is out for watching any form of safeguarding abuse you know, uh, that we could take immediate action. Uh, of course, we're linked in with the local security system. Those things are important. And then we give staff the assurance that we can take action irrespective of the lockdown. Do you have maybe just very few reflections? I mean, one of the things that you know I, I feel strongly about is that not every leader is you know a person with the right emotional intelligence level. So, leading on you know mental health and well-being does not necessarily have to be centralized or with a big boss. Every workspace have a particular person who may not necessarily be high up there in the rank of, I don't know, hierarchy, but is emotionally intelligent and people come to for emotional support. And I think that's the time to maybe bring them to the center and say, how do we, how do we go about this? You know, how do we personalize the communication? How do we check on people? So a lot of the conversations, the personalized conversations that Charles talked about are, are critical. But at the same time, for instance, one of the things that we have done was the, the morning coffee Zoom time. It is Zoom because, you know, that's what it is, but it's coffee time. It's, it's the time where we come together as a, as a team and just check on each other. What did you do during the weekend? Did you read a new book? You know, it's a, it's a light touch kind of get together that we would do if we were in the office in our coffee space. And then by default, you are visiting people's houses. So one of the things that I've done, I said, you know, let me take you, you know, in a tour around the place where I am. I wanted people to see that, you know, I converted part of my bedroom into my office. So I'm, I'm not any better. I don't have more space than you. What about you? What challenges are you dealing with? And then you have to think of some of the physical support. So one of the things, for instance, that we introduced was cycling, you know, cycle to work scheme, because people need to be to buy bicycles and those are expensive. They need to be insured and that's not cheap. So you have to think of the emotional and the practical and try to help people feel comfortable showing their vulnerabilities so that when they are in need for support they can reach out with ease and i think if if the workspace is very rigid and formal and the relationships did not exist before a lot of work need to be done to ensure that people are comfortable sharing their vulnerabilities or you know personal situations or family situations with you and that takes a lot of time and energy choose your emotionally smart person in the office and let them lead on that it helps a lot Thank you, Saba. Ronald, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I wanted to add one point. Um, I think as uh, Saba indicated, there's need to create that uh, degree of uh, trust before people can open up, but also provide practical options of where they can go for support. In our case, um, the HR has been very uh, supportive, mentioning that mental health is important, so creating the awareness in the first instance, and uh, also providing the spaces that people can go and uh, talk to a counselor and confidence without um, having to worry. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I'm gonna put a last call out for questions. Please put last call or feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat. And if not, I will just say thank you, everybody. Um, as I mentioned, um, there are a few different ways for everyone to stay involved. Um, we will make sure that in the next day, we only have one day left of the conference, we'll make sure everyone is, a, is willing and able to understand how to do so and continue to do so. 
Um, thank you for everyone who contributed to the very engage, engaging chat on the side. Uh, and thank you to our panelists and to our moderator, Saba, for a very um, engaging and enlightening conversation today. I, I, we just scratched the surface. There's so much more we could talk about, um, but it, 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 the hour flew by. Thank you, Kim. Take care, guys, and uh, be safe and sane. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes, bye.